Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? Today's guest is someone I met in my ad days. His name is David Bastido, and he's a creative technologist, photographer, artist, and speaker. His personal story is about passion, and you'll be able to see throughout our chat, David is passionate about exploring and following his curiosities. Like he puts it, it's about having and following dreams, chasing ideas and creativity. It is about making and creating things, taking chances, pushing himself, and often failing, constantly questioning how he wants to live today, tomorrow, and throughout the next part of his life. His professional story is rooted in the world of digital communications. For over 20 years, David worked in advertising agencies. He's been an independent digital consult in various guises, developing online strategies and creating content for clients ranging from car companies to alcohol and marijuana producers, politicians and rock bands, just to name a few. As a photographer, he shoots still and moving images of people and things documentary, and events, with a particular fondness for working with musicians. He's worked with one Canadian band in particular called The Tragically Hip and documented them for almost 15 years, as well as their lead singer Gord Downey. The images he made of The Tragically Hip have been published in print and online by every major newspaper in Canada and many international papers. They've appeared in ad campaigns on band merchandise, movies, TV, magazine covers, books, and posters, and are available for purchase as fine art prints and licensed music collectibles. In today's episode, David shares about his unconventional path and the ups and downs that followed, why he refuses to specialize, seeing failure as an opportunity for growth, how he's never satisfied seeing it as a curse and blessing, his appreciation for street art, what photography means to him, especially working with musicians, the famous hug photo he took of Gord Downey and how that led him to meeting the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau a couple of years later. And David made a special gift for us. He recorded his 50th birthday reflection piece on audio just for this podcast. I'm adding this as our bonus episode. David, I am so grateful for you. Thank you for this beautiful gift. And let's dive in. I'm still yeah. learning, but oh, I think I'm enjoying. That's I'm the enjoying. whole point though, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is the scariest point, but, you know, better done than perfect. This is what I'm learning right. to be better at. There's nothing yeah. perfect in life. I know. <laughs> so are you just doing this in yoga? What, what I'm doing other... this in yoga. I was, yeah. I'm still doing design. Freelancing, yeah, oh, okay. Oh, um, nice. But I'm looking that's to good to know. pivot into design and do less, uh, do, less do, and do yeah, less design do, yeah well yeah i know <laughs> so I that's like it's good to know but i still am open if there's a design project that's interesting and i feel like i have the space to do it i'll take yeah. it oh perfect yeah yeah so i haven't been doing much i'm do- working on a couple projects but i try not to do too much digital work. but you're always trying so many cool it seems oh i'm always doing things yeah you're I, always I mean, doing something uh yeah, I'm just trying not to do so much digital work. I feel really, really red. Hold on, I gotta change yeah. these lights. Hold on. The, the, the hat totally works. Yeah, <laughs> it, keeps, <laughs> it keeps everything together. So you're at home, you're working out of your house? You're, yeah, you're working at, at home. Nice. I've been working at home since um, I left Gravity. Oh, nice. And But I would go to cafes because I find myself being super productive, just having that background noise where people are doing something that's okay. where i function best at home I, I find myself cleaning or doing this or like eating and then i'm like okay it's hard yeah. to work at home 
Yeah, I see. I'm used to it. I don't. I don't have a problem with it. How has <laughs> um has COVID changed the way you do anything? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> uh, like work wise. Life. Everything. Well, oh yeah. I mean, it's totally changed everybody's life. Um. Like a lot of my friends are in music with no jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my friends, uh, I have friends that own multiple restaurants who have had to lay hundreds of people off. And I've just like been working to build up a business for 20 years and kind of watching it disappear. It's really sad. Um, for older people, I don't think COVID's been particularly kind. Uh, you know, it's hard on my parents. Mm -hmm. um, hard on families <laughs> but my day-to-day -day life like I work at home my wife works at home so it's kind of easy for us not to go out and then we were away for so long just on an island with uh, so nice. maybe 25 people who were all yeah. there like the on the island so they didn't really leave the island so it was pretty normal we just stayed apart from each other but I spent my summer gardening and yeah, I saw built that. A, I saw I you built a building greenhouse. Your green. yeah. yeah, how is that going? Good, it's great. Uh, what is going on now? How? Oh, the sun just came out behind me. That's what happened. That's why it happens to me as well. I sometimes disappear in my videos. I'm like, it's fine. Yeah, it's <laughs> There's weird. audio. I'm not used to it. I forgot. I can turn my lights up. If it if it doesn't go away, I'll turn my lights up. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to try awesome. it for a little bit? <laughs> I'm gonna try it for a little bit. Okay. This is weird. I'm not normally up here, but my office is such a mess that I can't really. <laughs> you can show it on camera. <laughs> no, I'm not prepared to do that. You're not prepared when the time no. is ready. Yeah. Ready uh, but yeah, start? COVID's like uh, it's a weird, you know, weird thing. I I was quite uh, um, stressed at the beginning, just the way my mind works. I go right to the you know, the worst cases. <laughs> really? But I see you, I guess, I see you handling everything non-stressfully. I was fine. I, no, I was pretty stressed for the first while. Uh, I cracked a, a molar uh, in the middle oh. of the panda t pandemic. I cracked uh, like a crown in, right in half. <sighs> um, and... Um, yeah, for the first couple of weeks, I was really stressed out. I quit smoking for like four months, and uh, it was it was weird. That How was that help. going? Oh, I started I started again, but yeah, it was it was fine. Um, and then yeah, before when people didn't really understand what was going on exactly, I think it was a lot more stressful than now. Yeah, personally, uh, you know, I wash my hands. I go to the store but I don't really do anything else yeah same I, haven't been out, I, I haven't been out for dinner I think uh in well since before the pen the first wave I haven't literally been to a restaurant yeah. um we cook a lot <laughs> so we're cooking a lot I've been cooking all sorts of new things yeah are you experimenting in the kitchen always <laughs> yeah I've made like all sorts of things I've made non- Indian food, uh, bagels, English muffins. Uh, I'm supposed to make a cheesecake this week. Bread. Uh -huh. uh, just different things. The kitchen of Dave. <laughs> yeah, I, I like I like cooking. That's we share good. we share chores. Yeah, I make the, and Megan's and then, also working. And then at I've home. been I've been yeah, Megan's working at home. She's she's in film and she started in uh, back at work in September. Oh, does she have to go anywhere? No, she s stays at home. That's but uh, her set is a Netflix series. They test three times a week, every mm -hmm. other day. So it's pretty safe. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have a friend on set working for Megan. And yeah, she gets tested every two days. Her poor nose. <laughs> yeah, I think she's used to it. But you know, yeah. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, she gets tested. Oh, wow. <laughs> she's That's, working. It's reassuring in a yeah. way. <laughs> And then, um, yeah, lots of walks, trying to do yeah. different things with my parents. I took my dad on a picnic. Yeah, I see and, you, like, uh, taking photos of them and spending time with them. Yeah, so my dad's uh, 
in his, my, both my parents are in their 80s and my dad's health is deteriorating. So I've been trying to spend a lot of time with them and just um, be there for them. So I was doing their shopping for a while and I spent a month with them this summer and my sister and I in particular try and do different stuff to keep them occupied. So we went for a yeah. walk this weekend and you can do what you do. Yeah. Do what you can. It's nice that they have you and have someone to take them around. And I know. You know I'm going to be like an old miserable all alone when I'm old. Oh, don't say that. You've made so many friends around oh, the world. I'm teasing. You won't feel alone. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Uh, what else have I been doing? I started making street art. I make, like, put signs up on the street. How did that always, come about? I've always wanted to do it. And I yeah. just never had so i did it i started doing it so you just um, felt the pull to do it yeah well in my neighborhood i've discovered a couple of artists uh, who use um street poles as their canvas for lack of a better word like these people who make sculptures i have no idea who they are but there's this one person in particular and they've done two sets of mass outdoor street sculpture works so if you were to walk on gerard street west on the north side of the street starting i used to think it started at river but i found a couple ones further east but around river street on the mm -hmm. north side of the street every second telephone pole approximately has these wooden sculptures on them. Are and they every, tiny? No, they're like this this big. They're square. They're made out of plywood. Everyone's a different color. Everyone has a different, like he cut on this series. Uh, I shouldn't say it's a he, I have no idea. The person cut a uh, matchbox cars in half and like embedded them in the wood. Yeah. And then there's an, another series uh, on Queen Street, walking east on the mm -hmm. north side of the street, that uh, yeah, there are these like multi-layered plywood works of art that have been there for uh, fifteen years or something. Wow. And, and then there's there's an alleyway. That? You have to. They're all over the city. These little works of art that people do, but you have to be treasures. A, you have to be observant and find them is what I've found. Like sometimes you walk by them a hundred times and then you're like, what? Yeah. Like there's this little sculpture on a telephone pole that um, I walk by and it took me a long time to find it. And it's like little gears and they're all nailed in individually to, to form like a face on a wooden pole. Like someone spent time doing it and thought about it. And then there's a bunch of people on Instagram. There's this one woman that I follow who embroiders um, sayings on pieces of cloth and then staples them to telephone poles. She doesn't live in Toronto, so but cool. and she does one every few days all over. And there's another person who leaves little hearts. There's a little collection of rocks on my street that people paint and leave in a pile in front of a house. I haven't done that yet. I have to paint. Are you off. planning to do one? Of course. Oh. But I like these little community spirited works of art that are motivated by nothing but joy and artistic uh, merit. Yeah. Not kind even merit. How, like, like just passion. Kind like of how you live your life. Yeah, that's why I like them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, isn't that partly what life is about? Not is. all of life, I, I suppose, but I mean, we all have one life to live. You might as well make the best of it. <laughs> yeah. So I, so I spend my time, yeah, exploring and playing and investigating and uh, trying to, I don't know if I'm trying to learn or find something. I'm always trying to find something. The search is never over, though. What do you think? I guess you're never satisfied in a sense where there's always more to explore. 
never satisfied it's a problem my wife thinks it's a problem <laughs> that's why i, I don't want to like position it that way but it's no a, it's true it's, a, it's like it's a, a thirst it's a, it's a thirst or uh some might call it an emptiness some might call it a motivation some might call it um a problem i don't know <laughs> i don't know if it's good or bad but it it there's always something to find out about or explore or do or i mean you just have to open your mind and go oh i'll try this today if you really mm -hmm. want to which is I mean, i've tried hard. so many <laughs> yes and no you have to let go a little bit and you have to not be afraid of failing and you don't have to like everything yeah. Like, there's no rule that says you have to like everything you try or that you're supposed to be good at everything you try. Um, Was that something you learned early on? That you don't have to like everything you try? Or, you know, you don't have to follow the rules, whatever, whoever made them. Uh, I was set up by my parents to not be afraid of a lot of things and i was set up to i wasn't very good at school but i liked learning school mm -hmm. failed me but i didn't fail the learning part i don't think the curiosity and and i did a history degree and that kind of taught me at least to be interested in understanding things and learning how to research and making your own kind of decisions yeah. Um, and my mother worked from an early age, so I was left on my own, uh, my family, my kids, my siblings, I should say. Yeah, we were left on our, to our own devices. We had a nanny, but, uh, my mother worked, um, as a stockbroker for 35 years. So my mother was, was an early sort of strong female. Yeah. Strong female lead. <laughs> strong female lead and um uh yeah I guess and my dad was sort of a bulldog <laughs> and, <laughs> what sense? And, well my dad is a, actually a trial lawyer and so he was a I call him a bulldog in a silk suit very yeah. edu educated man and uh nothing I don't think anybody in my family did anything the normal way <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah I kind of I, I started out thinking I should go their route and I guess when I was in my early 20s I started doing my securities course mm -hmm. and I got halfway through it through it and I said no fucking way I can't do this and uh yeah I never looked back what did you do like what were the I guess repercussions then uh I ended up um getting a job in film and television okay. out of university and then through that i got introduced to um kind of interesting uh, i worked on a show called kratz creatures which was a tv ontario interactive no sorry educational children's series and it was uh, a wildlife adventure series with uh, animation and they mm -hmm. got one of the first avid computer editing systems and to do the animation they had to buy uh, at the time it was an Amiga computer um, and they didn't have anybody to who knew how yeah. to use it yeah <laughs> the Amiga. so I got to learn how to use it and uh, I ended up with a friend of mine kind of just thinking about the internet and where it was all going and we ended up writing a 26 episode bible to an interactive educational children's television series about how things worked in uh i think it was 1996 mm -hmm. and i ended up taking that to the canadian film center and applying to a new program they had i did a residency in new media at the canadian film center back in uh, 1997 wow. and from there I got a job in advertising by accident. <laughs> How did that happen? Someone needed a um, 
a CD-ROM completed in Director. And I went down to do, I don't know how I got the call, but I got the call and I went <laughs> and uh, I think I spent two days there and it was for a guy who was, uh, had a company called Think Interactive, which was a part of TBW Shy Day. Uh, Shy at Day. Um, and it was sort of like their first digital marketing company. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there for, uh, I think, two years two after years. that. And then I went to McLaren McCann. And then I started my own company mm -hmm. in 2000. And then, what were you doing? What was your own company? Uh, 10 plus one communications. I started with a guy named Sean Pucknell and there was another guy, a couple other guys and we did uh, flash games and animations and uh, interactive. We did the first large scale multi-user world. We did games for CBC kids. We did educational content for TV Ontario. We did stuff for the PC party of Ontario, so I, I recall, like we did yeah. a lot of a variety of things and started Flash in the Can, which Sean really did. And then uh, we split up after uh, maybe 2003 or something, the company split up and I went on my own. I kind of been on my own ever since with uh, exception of a few years at Gravity where I met you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, here we are. Oh, so I wanted to share, I wanted to share a piece that I saw you posted earlier when you turned 50 sure. this year. <laughs> and it was such a beautiful, reflective piece. Oh, um, no, thank you. I would love to I had link a look it. at it today because you, pardon me? <laughs> I would love to link it to listeners, like oh, yeah, piece, if yeah, you're yeah, comfortable with it. Of course. <laughs> but I'm going to read I'd even read it. I can, I can give you an audio version of it, but... Uh, Are you willing to do that? That would be amazing. Yeah, that could be like Happy a bonus part. <laughs> okay, I'll start. I'm still inspired every day. I'm still learning, exploring, dreaming, creating. There's always something to do, never enough time to do it all. I have learned many things, but there is still so much to learn that I do not know that I am interested in. I am enamored by this quest and following my curiosities and seeing what is behind each door what new questions, dreams, and inspirations are revealed. I chose my own path, and in doing so, I found love. I try not to be afraid to fail. I have learned that a little fear is good, that a little fear keeps you honest, keeps you healthy. Not failing, that is a matter of pride with me. Stubbornness, through failure, I have found success. Success feels good, figure out something out. Creating something, doing something good, accomplishing a goal, I never really had a life goal, never had a real plan. I continued to stumble from one thing to another. After many things, I took a windy road and I have found my path to be interesting and rewarding. Never dull, I am never bored. I've had many jobs, each with challenges, successes and failures. I've worked hard. I've worked with the most incredible, smart, inspiring people. I refuse to specialize. I continue to follow my interests and passions continue to add to my skill set to apply my diverse background, skills, curiosities, and experience to new problems to create and build and imagine new things. That's a part of the very, very beautiful reflection of turning huh. 50. <laughs> and oh, you've definitely you. lived your life this way. So when we met at Gravity a couple of years ago, I remember your curious nature. You were you know, one of the partners, and you were also like the go-to guy to fix everything and anything that <laughs> nobody, nobody were like, I guess, had, nobody knew how to solve. They were like, David will figure it out. David is here. And you are, because you, you played. I think that's why I really enjoyed working with you. Even for like silly shoots, you were playing. You're like, we're going to figure out how to flip the hula hoop into the flamingo. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it was always this like, no pressure to really prove anything other than We'll, we're going to figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Almost, almost always figure it out. It's really, <laughs> yeah. it's time, time and energy, really, and uh, will. Sometimes you don't have enough time. Sometimes you don't have enough energy, and sometimes you don't have enough will. Right. Without any one of those things, 
you can't always complete the task. <laughs> so with all the different hats you've worn before, how did you get your, how do you find yourself in them? I know you shared a little you get bit. get lost all the time. You get lost get, all the time? I got lost all the time. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm always searching. So it's sort of, you know, it's, it's part of the curse is you kind of, you get bored with one thing or you want to spend your time doing something else when you're supposed to do this thing. Yeah, but or, supposed by what standards? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, I've been building a sculpture for three years. <laughs> I can't finish it. Really? Yeah. Like, um, and, you know, like the street art, I have a whole bunch of street art I want to do, but it's yeah. priorities partly and time and I, uh, I don't like to work all the time anymore. I worked a lot in the past and, uh, I'm kind of done with that. So mm -hmm. I like to play and I'll play just as hard as I used to work, yeah. but, uh, there's not really a huge amount of pressure to, to do things like I used to do. How I mean, did there you is. used to do things? Well, when you're working for someone else, I guess it's different uh, priorities. Mm -hmm. Partly when you're working for yourself or on your own, you, you're not relying on someone else and you're the only one who can make or break it. <laughs> right? Which I also like. I mean, I like being relying on myself often. Not all the time. I like working with people. Working with people is just uh, sometimes more difficult. Yeah, because you have to find the right people. <laughs> yeah, you have to compromise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, everything's about compromise in the end of the relationships or whatever. So compromise is fine. But uh, I don't know how I used to work. I just, uh, I felt the pressure to work. I felt the pressure to I guess, earn and be independent and, uh, you know, be, be something that I didn't really want to be, I guess. Like I, the ad agency, I've worked in it in the, the marketing world for 20 some odd years. It's a grind. It's, it's not meant to, um, really create nice people. It's not really a, an industry designed to make you feel good about yourself. It's not an industry that cares about your health physically or mental. Um, you are always under the gun. They're always asking you for more for less. I mean, kind of the economy is set up that way right now. Everybody's being asked to do more for less. Nobody really mm -hmm. cares. So well, one of the things that's come out of the pandemic is people appreciate people more you know and and people appreciate the local business more and the restaurant that they can't go to now and the, the things that people do that they never want to do work in a grocery store or be a frontline worker or you know all these things that we rely on you know that that are actually kind of important more important than we thought uh, it kind of changes your perspective. So, I mean, partly what I have been fighting my entire life is, I guess, uh, you know, the perspective of being born here and with the family that I have and knowing that I've been privileged and, uh, you know, I'm male and I'm the, a white guy born to a parents who work and have money and you know that's it's different uh, I can't take any of that away uh, and I appreciate it I've been trying to appreciate it I guess and sometimes more successfully than others and and I think you know as I get older I appreciate it more and appreciate uh, how lucky we are as, as individuals and as a community and as a society that we live where we do. And, you know, I think it's important to participate in politics, not all, you know, in the course of one's life and to give back to the community. And if you have more than others, share. I mean, 
they're kind of basic tenants, but yeah, <laughs> basic human uh, decency, which everyone should learn at school. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think that it's it's uh, there's nothing revolutionary, but you know, actually trying to do some of these things, even if you do them every now and then, makes you a better person. And I try and do them, not always successfully, but you know, yeah, we do what we can. <laughs> That's all we can do, right? Try and give back, yeah. Yeah. I remembered um, when we were working together, trying to figure stuff out, you just mentioned bypassing. You're like, because I'm like, David, David, you're so cool. You can do everything and anything. You're oh, like, uh, I was sort of like the black sheet of the family. I'm like, why? I guess it came with like choosing your own path. Uh, well, choosing my own path that way i mean my father was a lawyer who did a phd and a law degree and then opened his law his own practice and he was in school till he was maybe 35. um i never wanted to do that my mother had three kids and then uh went back to work uh almost at uh close to my age a little bit younger than me maybe 47 and worked for 35 years wow. in a new career. Yeah, totally reinvented herself as a businesswoman. That's powerful stuff. And, and I don't think people, some people are meant to do one thing and some people aren't. I'm not meant to do one thing. <laughs> I would drive me nuts. I yeah. would be intolerable, <laughs> I yeah. think. You know, but some people have the patience for it. I have patience, but not for the same thing day in and day out. And uh, I like to be creative. So you have to find different ways to be creative. Creativity doesn't just drop in your lap. And creativity, I think, you have to kind of train yourself to be creative. And you have to... How do you train yourself? Not like just by thinking about things and daydreaming and uh you know researching i mean even if it's a it's as simple as a color you have to look at a lot of colors to know what colors you like yeah i mean you can create a color and like it but you don't know what other colors are out there so without experience it's really hard to um, compare and contrast i guess yeah yeah, and we, I think a lot of us try to fit into the mold of what we're told, you know? Yes. And stay and, in this lane. <laughs> yes, very much. And um, yeah, I never f felt comfortable in the mold. But people think that I'm weird often because I don't stay in the mold. You know, I have a friend, he's like, why are you always posting pictures of yourself? What? I no, think it I'm takes just, a lot of courage to do what feels right for you and not yeah others. i hold back <laughs> you hold back really oh yes i uh, my it's easier for me to hold back for my wife would think i was nuts if i didn't hold back at least something <laughs> As an example, I had a, to go with that, that thing that you read, I had a really great, uh, I did a naked self portrait of myself in the woods. On my oh, that birthday. is amazing. And I was going to post it and my wife <laughs> asked me, she didn't tell me not to, but she asked me to reconsider it. <laughs> That's the balance, right? <laughs> I personally had no problems with it, but I re reconsidered for on her behalf. <laughs> you know, so I'll I'll post it one day. I just won't yeah. post it that day when the time feels right. I don't know, but yeah, you know. So, so I, I, your... I feel like I hold back. You feel like you hold back? Would, A little bit. Would you like to? I don't know. Huh. I'm not really sure. That's the way it sure. is. <laughs> uh, maybe. That's the way it is. Yeah. I, don't, I hold back less and less as I get older. I think that that's the thing, is that you feel more comfortable being yourself. But there's always a... There's a big gray area about... I like to live in the gray. I don't necessarily like to be black and white. Mm -hmm. 
So gray can be, as you know, gray is a wide ranging and broad color spectrum. Yeah. In a way to keep yourself from being limited because it is daunting and I feel a lot of people want to explore things, but there are so many fears imposed to them and what it's like even when I decided to quit advertising I didn't last 20 years like you I, I think I barely lasted five years in agency and I was like I'm done I well, cannot I it mean, doesn't feel right for me it, it's not it, it's not a, a great environment to be honest it's it's uh emotionally economically socio and ec I mean it's not meant to make you happy <laughs> yeah. the end result isn't happiness. I mean I think people the best people in marketing hate marketing because they understand the power and they understand um, the effectiveness of it and that's it's scary I mean it's look a at lot what, of responsibility look at what Trump has done and how he is if communicated and you know look at historical figures and how they've used branding and marketing and imagery so it's not all good yeah and having the courage to walk away and still but even when you were in advertising you had a couple of projects on ago you were doing you were shooting concerts well, yeah, <laughs> you so were I managing have this, a brand i have i have you know i always try things so I, I've always taken pictures. I started taking pictures when I was in grade eight and I grew up with a dark room. My parents gave me a dark room and I spent my entire youth um, taking pictures in a, and developing them in a dark room at home. And then uh, digital came and there was this weird transformation between analog and digital. And so a lot of people gave up um, photography as a result and I basically gave up for a long time because analog was analog and the quality of digital wasn't there and it was far too expensive and I didn't my wife gave me a digital camera I think for Christmas maybe in 2000 a little I think it was maybe a four megapixel oh. Fuji camera, like just a little tiny thing. Yeah. And that got me back into taking pictures. And then uh, I had gotten a job with this band <laughs> called The Tragically Hip, making a website. And uh, I started taking pictures again. And then I've been taking pictures of bands uh, for 15 years I guess now and I worked years. with the, I think so and I uh, no longer because I worked with some bands before that I worked with Hugh Dillon who was my first um, music client uh, 2003 so 17 years and I've been taking um, pictures and videos and making web content um, throughout most of that time uh, for bands how did you get involved in the music industry? <laughs> uh, I was always interested in music. It just through friends who were in the business and I was taking pictures and they needed websites. So it started with web and then it went into content because nobody was really making dynamic content at the time. It was all, you know, a car website would be redone twice a year. Blogs didn't really exist social media didn't exist we had forums and uh you know at the time uh flash was just sort of starting and uh yeah it was just a different time <laughs> but that's yeah. how i got started websites uh -huh. and then uh taking pictures and then uh i met other people over time and more pictures I've been uh, yeah I've been all over the world taking pictures to be honest yeah. what do you love the most about taking photos um well there's different kinds of photos there's there's one of the things I do is documentary photography where I am 
a fly on the wall where I am an observer, not a participant. And um, I like doing that a lot and it's gotten to me a lot of places and I've met a lot of people. And it's different than being a participant in a photograph. Being a participant, I'm, we might be standing across from each other, I might be holding my camera and I might ask you a question. Or I might tell you to smile. Uh, and then I might capture your smile after I've asked you to smile. Whereas the documentary style, you kind of disappear. Your job is to allow everything to happen naturally and to be an observer. And I did that with the Tragically Hip uh, for, I guess, 13 years or something and um, I loved yeah I loved it I, I liked the music I liked live shows I liked people coming together the bands that I've worked with have been some of the best in the I mean I've really only worked with Canadian musicians but they're some mm -hmm. of the best most well-known Canadian musicians ever and I got to watch them create and um, be and I got to become friends with them and ask them questions and uh, watch and learn and uh, yeah I mean that's exciting I've done it with politicians I've done it with musicians um, I went to Thailand last year for uh, a year, a month, sorry, uh, for work, and we took pictures of all throughout um, Chiang Mai, the, the province we were in, in the city. Uh, I went to, uh, and then content creation is a little different, uh, and I don't quite like content creation as much um, because you're it's more like marketing i can do it i like the artistic side of content more than the marketing side of content but i i can do it but i like the creative yeah. i'm with you i'm with you <laughs> you know that's just me I, I i can do it for money but i prefer to, i prefer to do it for joy right and like I love being a fly on the wall to take photos too. There's something magical about just letting go and capturing what's happening. Yeah, now there's different like I will shoot a few weddings, but weddings I I don't know if I really I haven't decided if I enjoy them or not. You're still testing. I'm still testing. <laughs> uh, I find weddings are a lot of pressure. And to be honest, I find any paid image kind of intense. Not taking them, per se, delivering them. Mm -hmm. There's an expectation that I can't get over that someone would be disappointed, <laughs> that I didn't do good enough, that I didn't do the best that I could, that I could do better, that it doesn't look good enough, that it's out of focus here, that technically I'm a failure. I go through it, all of these emotions. So um, still, even oh my God, so yes. many years. Oh, every time. So as an example, I've just delivered a, a, a print. I, I sell images to a framer that I sold. And um, it's the second image that I've sold of this particular print. And the first image, uh, I really liked the first print. And I sold it. And the next printing, I did something differently. And it didn't look the same. And I've been obsessing over this one print. Like, I've lost money on the print because I think <laughs> I've printed the second one probably 20 times, probably, um, to get a print that I was, 
uh, confident enough to ask my wife if it looked okay. Uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> and the two prints I showed her, she's like, they basically mm -hmm. look the same. So I don't know. I, I still don't know. It's at the framer now. I'm going to deliver it next week and I'm going to, I'm going to feel uptight about it until weeks after Christmas. <laughs> Thank you for admitting that because I know a lot of people, especially in creative, I know photographers that take great photos, but the pressure they put on themselves where, you know, you could just go for a walk and take a really great shot and then the expectation is there for next time to do the same thing. And it's yeah, such but it's, a huge block. No, I also, uh, that's the way I live my life. I'm confident, but I, I'm always not confident. And I always feel like I'm missing something or there's more. So I, I took some shots um, recently of a band, publicity photographs, and I obsessed over them. And, um, I noticed in the images that I think there's something wrong with my lens. <laughs> and I think maybe the right side of my lens isn't as sharp in focus as the left side of my lens. Never noticed before, don't even know, I have to test it. But something's off and I'm like obsessing about these and I'm like, oh my God, they're the worst. And I spent days making them. And I delivered them. And then there's sort of like, I send them off. And then there's this silence. And I'm like, oh, my God. They hate them. They hate them. <laughs> and then I get this text <laughs> from one of the guys who was in the, in the image. And the text says... Uh, the text said, let me find it. Wow, I love every photo. You're a magician. <laughs> so How I did it make you feel getting that? On one hand, I'm like, he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other hand, I was like, oh my God, I think I made it through another one. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh my God, faked my way through that one. You know, still, after all these years, 20 years, 15 years, I'm still like, oh. And you're, I mean, and you've been pretty, I guess, in quotation, successful in a sense that, you know, you are recognized for your photography and all of it, but still. It still just, it still makes me queasy. Yeah, it's human, I think. And my prints, like, so a lot of people don't print their work. I print, I print my work and I obsess over it. And I find once you print your work, as opposed to taking an image and throwing it up on Instagram or whatever, which is its own thing. But once you print your work and someone's paying for it and it's in a frame, it's different. And you have to live with it. Like you're throwing it, you're putting it out there and you have to, you have to be okay with it. And that mm -hmm. is, you know, you have to be okay showing your work to other people, whether you're a creative or advertising or, or whatever. And you have to, as soon as you do that, you open yourself up to failure. <laughs> Ah, let's talk about failure. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and what does that mean? And and failure to whom? And how how do you like yeah. measure it? Feel it? How do you cope with it? Does failure like failure is different to everybody? So, you know, how do you judge the success of your own output? <laughs> mm -hmm. Really, at the end of the day, and I, I it's challenging. You know, when other people are, are, you know, everybody is, not everybody, but I have a partner and, you know, we all have different versions of what success is at different times in our lives and, and how you measure and, and um, deal with how that changes. Because it changes personally as well, right? Part of it's economic and part of it's emotional and part of it's mental and, and part of it's, uh, uh, 
you know, how other people accept your work or not, I guess. I don't know how I deal with it. I don't know. It's like everybody. Yeah. I should one, connect one, day to, one, one day at a time. Yeah, I should connect you to my husband because, you know, he does take really good photos, but sometimes he feels this immense pressure and he noticed things that I wouldn't notice. I'm probably like more like Megan where I'm like, it looks great. But then he gets obsessive and I'm like, but don't be like, you have to keep going. <laughs> yeah, but you, you would obsess about something differently. Something else you would obsess about. Uh, maybe a, a piece that you're working on, you would obsess over. I know you would. Don't pretend you wouldn't. <laughs> I don't know. I think I've gotten better. I am. No, like, but I when do we have were working, when we were when we were working together, you wanted your work to be as good as you could do it. Yeah, as good uh, as uh, I can control it, and then how people see it. That is not up to me like somebody yeah might that's what it. i'm saying somebody. you have to let go of it at some point yeah. you have to let go but you have to be ready to let go and and that's an emotional journey and that's an, how do you know when you're ready to let go like how would you know when your sculpture project is ready oh well that one's a slightly different because it's it <laughs> i'll tell you about my sculpture i don't know when it's i'm on my like fifth prototype my sculpture is um you asked me how earlier you asked me about my street art yeah. and this is this is how it started i was walking down uh queen street by my house one day uh years ago and there was a construction hoarding up in front of a store and there's a street car stop here so you if you're waiting for the street car you'd be standing in front of this construction hoarding and I laughed to myself because I thought, oh, it would be fun to have like an interactive sculpture there that if you stood in front of this while waiting for the streetcar, it would do something. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, oh, I could make a beating heart. And if you stood there, it would beat faster. And right at the apex of when you would have a heart attack, it would play a song and it would play I Can't Get Enough for Your Love Baby by Barry White. Yeah. And that started a three-year journey of creating a beating heart an interactive that's beating how heart it started. yeah this particular sculpture and that's so i started making this beating heart uh, out of arduino and i learned how to cast resin and carve resin and um, i've hooked it up to all sorts of different sensors and none of them are quite right i haven't got it to play music yet but i've done all i've hooked this beating heart up to a, a heartbeat monitor so you can put your finger on it it'll beat like your heart yeah. to a accelerometer to uh pressure sensors to um, laser sensors so when you walk in front of it yeah it'll do something and now see i keep developing the idea so now i want to do a bunch of these hearts and i want to program each heart with a socioeconomic background <laughs> so within the heart it will have it will be it will have a gender identity it will have a, a socioeconomic background and based on where it is uh, from it will have a different um, a different life expectancy and different health ramifications. And I'm going to program uh, life expectancy and health defects into the heart <laughs> so that uh, it could basically replicate uh, people born in, in different, yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. It, will have, it will have sensors um, that interact with the environment it is in and the sensors will interact with the uh, personality and socioeconomic traits so every heart would react slightly differently and um, then they'd all be in a room and every heart would be beating slightly differently and yeah a heart could die it could develop a different yeah. defect 
I want to scan your brain because this is like such an amazing, like, how do you go around thinking about all these things and connecting the dots? This is such a fun project. (laughs) That one. So I was doing the heart and I'm like, people keep telling me I should look for funding. And I'm like, I don't know, funding. And I don't know how to get funding for anything. So I've never got funding for that kind of thing ever. And everything I know about funding, you always have to wrap it in some fucking hoity-toity little story which i hate in in the art world i hate having to write or thinking about uh my brain doesn't work like that i don't do political artistic statements per se i don't think about things that way i just want to create (laughs) it it takes on part of my personality whatever it is but someone said that I could get funding for this idea and so I started wrapping it you know I was trying to like project out and be someone else I'm like okay if I turned it into this socioeconomic hoity-toity thing maybe someone would give me fucking money for it yeah and then I thought it was kind of fun (laughs) so I started programming it and then uh it got kind of complicated but (laughs) I think I saw you share some photos where it was a heart with some light around it yeah, I, uh, yes, yeah, so I can show you, I can send you pictures, but yeah, it's, um, it's a heart, and then I've carved out a heart, and there's like a LED light behind this little beating heart, and then there's a LED lights that shine out, yeah. and then one version I have lights on the back, so it kind of, and I can change the colors of lights, and I can... Uh, program patterns and I can make the lights move and part of it's just been getting the uh, the heartbeat right (laughs) and so I started looking at EKGs and I was trying to um, trying to model the heartbeat of a real EKG (laughs) so I've like broken it down into little parts that are measured in microseconds almost and I can do it but it doesn't look very good. <laughs> so really? it's kind of, it's too fast. Like a heart beats really quickly. That's and, so fascinating. What so do you I'm, do with this extra knowledge? <laughs> um, apply it to some, anyway. So I'm, so I'm trying to decide whether I should program it. So it beats like at the heart. And then I actually know of a doctor who's trying to do a heart project <laughs> And who's a friend of a friend of a friend who I know quite well. So I'm thinking of emailing the doctor, who yeah. is a creative guy. He's a filmmaker, and uh, he's been on black, uh, white coat, black art. You know, on CBC when they talk to doctors. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, and see if he wanted to do something. But I'm, I'm still trying to work it all out. And I haven't added the music yet. So, and then the challenge is to fit all the parts into the shell of the heart so um i was making this heart and it used the first thing i used uh was like a uh, infrared it's like a little laser but it's infrared and it would be used in a factory for counting things as they come off a conveyor so it'd go yeah and so that would that's what you stood in front and in front of. And if you stood in front of it, then the heart beat faster. But it was really ugly. So I've tried about three or four different things. And they were all all required external interfaces in terms of how they interacted with people. So it would be like the heart would be here and then there would be this thing over here. And I was like, that's kind of lame. And if I put it in the heart, then I had to have a hole in the heart. And I've discovered um, radar. What is radar? Right, you know, like for airplanes in World War II, radar. Yeah. The, yeah. So <laughs> I can. They have these little radar chips, and I'm now um, testing radar because <laughs> it can. I'm hoping it will be able to detect people in front of it. Um, while it's inside the enclosure so you won't even know it's there so then if as soon as you walk into the room they're in light bulbs and things so if you're like walking and your light turns on there are different ways to it's because of the sensor 
yeah, different sensors that can trigger that kind of thing. So I'm looking for hidden sensors. And um, so I'm hoping it will be radar. And then I have a vibration sensor. So if you like turn the music up in your house and it starts to vibrate. Yeah. And then there's an accelerometer. So if you pick it up, it'll change color. And part of it is the notion of this heart is I want it to be tactile. And I want mm -hmm. ideally that you could pick it up and it would react and then you can put it on the wall and it'll rest but it has to look good and it all has to be self-contained and then there's power issues it's i kind of open a can of worms yeah you're doing all this by yourself it seems like something from the future a futuristic self-reflective well, art you know piece. you get inspired by all sorts of things and i get inspired by weird things so there's this and i read all sorts of weird stuff i don't know and i read about this guy in uh seattle washington a few years ago and he um, had created a boat okay with a um uh a little motor and a solar panel and gps and he put this boat he spent i think two years working on it and he put this boat into the ocean in seattle and then he watched it on his computer as it traveled to Hawaii. And then he got on a plane and he flew to Hawaii and he picked up his boat as it floated into the harbor. <laughs> and I was really? like, that is fucking cool. That is, wow. And, you know, we live in a time like no other time where we have so much information at our fingertips that if you're really interested in something, you can learn how to do it. And you can get in touch with people who will help you or, you know, YouTube or even if you're faking half of it, you can accomplish a lot. And it might not be, you know, worthy to, uh, you know, support life. <laughs> you know, you know, I might not be making a heartbeat monitor machine that will summons, but it, you can do a lot very easily. And I think one of the things, things aren't as complicated often as they seem to be. Yeah, <laughs> like that's factories. your life motto. <laughs> well, factories, like producing a product. Sometimes you think it's so complicated and at the end of the day, there's a thing in a box and a bag and you put the thing in the bag and you put it in a box and you put the label on and all of a sudden you have a product. And it's like, oh, if you think about it that way, okay, the bag can look nicer and you can rearrange it in the thing in the bag someone wants but if you break it down into these little steps each step is manageable mm -hmm. and that's really like anything each step is manageable and and some steps you can trial and error you can take a picture five times at different apertures and look to see what it looks like you know you can and, and that's failure as well you fail four times to get one that you like if you've taken five pictures i guess but is it failure if it had to happen for you to get that fifth well picture? I, um, that's what I'm, it's part of perspective whether to get to move forward you have to shut things down if right. that makes sense like to get a good picture, for me, I have to make a choice usually between A and B. There's never just an A. Yeah. yeah. Even if it's just A, you've printed it or you've 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 edited it different ways and you have a choice between edit one, edit two, and edit three, black and white in color, or more saturation or less, or a little less shadow on the face or, yeah. or anything. But at the, at the end of the day, when you're making, when you have these two things, you choose one, you're saying no to the other one, kind of. Yeah, that's basically right. it. <laughs> it is a hard process, because especially when you I never really expressed it that way before. <laughs> I'm always second guessing my, my work always i don't think i'll ever not second guess my work but i think if you don't second get like i guess some people don't they're just like yeah it's done and yeah. then it's done gord downey the 
the singer of the tragically hip i don't think he ever finished anything i mean he would change lyrics to songs he'd written years before all the time when he was singing them live and he'd do it on purpose because he wasn't happy he was trying new things out and um he tried lyrics out on stage before songs were written really which was interesting yeah um yeah in the middle of other songs he he would they he used to call them or they the fans used to call them rants and he would start on a rant about some free form conscious something that he'd been thinking of or not and uh, it, sometimes it would turn into a song years later it almost as if it becomes a collective yeah creation of oh something. for sure and and uh you know sometimes you have to test things out to see how you feel about them yeah. i'm not i'm not really afraid of doing that either <laughs> and that's kind of failure kind of not and to your point um if it's part of the process then it's not really failure it's part of the process it's, it's the journey as they say yeah it is totally i'm all the about journey. i'm about the journey yeah and everything that you do and explore i can even feel that energy from your photos and oh. your reflections and how you think about it and it's just you know it it's someone who's very present in the moment I try and be present in the moment. I would say some people don't think I'm present all the time. And I think yeah, everybody chooses what moments maybe to be more present in. Mm -hmm. And live music and photography, I go out of my way to, uh, I probably be more present because I enjoy it. And some of it's reactionary. And some of, some of it is, just being aware of your surroundings and being open to, um, I'm pretty open to new things and I'm pretty open to the wind changing my direction. Yeah, you follow the wind. <laughs> I'm open to it bringing something to me. <laughs> Yeah, you I'm share not sure something. If I, I'm not sure if I quite follow the wind, but I'm open to it blowing around me and bringing in a leaf and grabbing the leaf and going, oh, that's yeah. cool. What did you say? Sorry. I think I No, I was just taking what you were saying. Oh. I was like, yeah, that's kind of just, for me, the way I interpret it, it's like, yeah, being, just working with whatever comes in your way, not really controlling it. And you can't control life. You can, you can make preparations but you can't control it so even take photography you have a big gig you lay out the gear on a table the night before you look at everything you check it you make sure you have everything you still forget something yeah. <laughs> or you might not you might not have forgotten it you might uh, have put it aside and go oh, i probably won't need that right all you can do is or your lens that you got a I don't know I don't know even if I don't even know if I was imagining my lens I'm, I'm still not yeah sure. yeah <laughs> but you have to be able to take it on the chin life isn't easy as my mother said it, it wasn't ever supposed to be and yeah. if you think life is going to be easy then you're in for a bit of a surprise <laughs> one i don't know i wanted to talk about you know one of the photographs you took the hug with gord down mm. tell me about that moment and what led you to meeting the prime minister later on oh well okay so i i worked in politics for many years and i volunteered with my local riding association provincially and federally and at one point i was the communications director in my local riding association and and at that time you know, i live in the toronto danforth riding and at the time jack layton was the sitting federal member for the NDP in my riding and then he passed away and as a result there was a by-election and it was 
um, the only by-election federally in Canada between Obama winning the presidency the first time and the next federal election in Canada, which was uh, maybe 2000 and I want to say 2008 or something, but anyways, um, when I worked on that election, I, um, maybe it was a bit later than that, but I, I did communications and I did all the social media for the election and every MP that was in the liberals at the time came through and I met senators and MPs and everybody. And one of the people that came through uh, was uh, Trudeau. And so I spent a day hanging out with Trudeau and the candidate whose name was Grant Gordon at the time. And I'd met him maybe once before. No, I hadn't met him before, but I, I met him then. And then um, fast forward to uh, the hip, he was a hip fan and I'd met him at concerts before, just said hi or whatever. And then, um, for the final concert in Kingston, the prime minister came and I'd been told that there was going to be a meeting between the prime minister and the band before the concert. So I was waiting and hanging out in the hallway, uh, for the, the appointed time and about a couple minutes before the time the prime I got word that the prime minister was coming and he was going to arrive early and uh anyway so I was there and we go into the room where everybody's meeting and I didn't have a very good angle because there was a documentary team and there was another photographer and all the RCMP people, the other photographer being a guy named Adam Scotty, who's the prime minister's photographer. And we kind of got into the room like this and we were on the wrong side of everything. And I kind of looked at him and I made the conscious decision to go out of the room. There were two doors. So I had to go out. And then I came back in where everybody had just come in and I kind of went under everybody. And just as I come into the room and I, and I've like kind of had to duck under everybody <laughs> because the room is really crowded and I hit a light. And just as I hit a light, it makes a noise. The picture happens and I hit the light. The RCMP guy looks at me and starts shaking his head. They're going in for the hug and I go. Ch -ch 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 -ch. <laughs> and that's um, how you got that moment. <laughs> that's how I got the picture. And after I'd made this decision to leave the room and get another perspective. And then uh, after the prime minister left, we kind of, I looked at the shot and I showed the band manager and he said, post it. And so we posted it right before um, the concert started. And that picture, uh, yeah, went all over. Um, it went all over. And then a few years later, I participate in a, um, it's called uh, the the I think it's called the Holiday Basket Brigade, and it's a local organization that a friend of mine and a group of like-minded individuals started to uh, address food scarcity um, in our local neighborhood. So they create gift baskets of Christmas dinners. And every year, uh, for the last maybe three years, I've gone down and I've taken pictures to volunteer. And last year, I um, met our MP, who's a woman named uh, Julie De Bruzen, and she uh, is the Liberal MP for our riding. And uh, I asked her kind of I've I've no I've met her uh, numerous times and I've known her over the years and I asked her I said hey Julie so I have this thing and I was wondering if 
you could get me a, a meeting with the prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> and she's kind of like, what? And I said that I had, she knew of the picture, but what she didn't know is that I had printed seven copies of that picture and I got Gord Downey to sign six of them before he passed away. And I got him to address them to specific people. One of them was the prime minister. Uh, one I have for the band and another was for me. And one was for the Canadian archives and a couple other people who were close to us. And I told her that I had these pictures and that Gord had signed them. And if was there any hope in hell that she could get me a meeting with the prime minister. Yeah. And she said, I'm going to make it happen. And maybe two weeks later, I got an email and it was like, uh, can you, you meet the prime minister after question period next Tuesday? In <laughs> Ottawa, right? In Ottawa. I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> Well, I told my wife, I'm like, what are you doing on Tuesday? <laughs> Cancel all like, your plans. <laughs> Do you want to go meet the prime minister? I got a meeting. Yeah. So I, I asked my MP if I could bring my wife. She said, yes. Yeah. So we drove to Ottawa with pictures in hand, went to question period, got a tour of uh, the House of Commons uh, from my MP. And then we went to the prime minister's two offices. So we went to his, um, he has an office right by the, the house of commons. And um, we went to that office and had a meeting and got a hug, <laughs> had the pictures <laughs> and, and that he has his photographer. Uh, so I got pictures of it and he signed. There was a slight incident where only he was supposed to sign six and only five got signed. So one, it's complicated. It wasn't my fault, but <laughs> yeah. something got messed up. And one image I noticed after, so I left one image. So one image is a wall, but um, I have, hold on one sec. Oh. That's from Gore. And then. Oh. Wow. That's, That's beautiful. And uh, I just had it framed a little while ago. And then, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's kind yeah, of like but... a full circle moment with your hug at the end. I know, end. right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then I've been able to give a couple of them away so far to the right people that I, they were intended for. And I'm kind of making my way <laughs> through that. Maybe the and, last picture will be signed. You never know. I feel like you planted the seed years ago when you printed I feel it like and I'm gonna, I feel like I'm going to get the picture back. It's weird. These things have a way of... Um, the universe is a funny place. So I'm not actually that worried that I will... That picture will find its way back to me somehow. I think it will. I, I and I'm not sure will. how or when or where, but I'm I'm pretty sure it will find its way back. Anyways, I uh, yeah, that picture uh, means a lot. It just kind of uh, summarized a lot of a lot of things. But yeah, that picture was just just the weirdest. Uh, circumstances when I decided to leave and then come back in and I hit this light and and uh, yeah it was just kind of crazy yeah in, in the you midst don't of know, madness you know when you're doing something like you don't really you know what you're trying to accomplish you don't necessarily know what the result will always be just follow that instinct yeah you just kind of 
do your best. Yeah. Oh, gosh. What are some values that you live by? Oh. I try to be nice as much as possible. I try to be kind and caring. Family is important. Uh, I'm pretty, pretty, I think my values are, are pretty normal. Do good, don't be bad, be nice, don't be not nice when you can. Like, uh, Yeah, I, I don't think they're, you know, treat the world better than you left it. I mean, I, I think that's as good as you can get. Be be better, like, do do things better than when you found it. And every, everything will be all right. If we all could leave things better than how we found them, the world would be a much better place. I'll be kind. The world's too short, especially the life is too short, especially with the pandemic. It just really puts into perspective how uh, precarious and fragile the balance of the world is. And, you know, realize that it's not a it's not a equal value proposition for everybody. <laughs> and that a lot of people have been screwed. And if you're not one of those people, then uh, then your history is probably based on someone, someone being screwed, uh, in, in, a, and I think you should be aware of that. One should be aware of that, really. Um, I don't know. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> I don't think it's rocket science to be, to, to be good. I think I, takes, that's what I think, but you I, do see that common sense is not very really common for a lot of people yeah well my wife and i f argue over common sense and what is common sense and everybody's common sense is slightly different i have to i have to agree like but values good and evil are pretty intrinsic values that we should all know about and if you choose to be evil then you choose to be evil you probably not everybody but most people know when they're doing something they shouldn't whether it's small or big they know when they're going through a red light they know when they're speeding they you know people should slow down you know in the cities it's just it's i drive slower now i you know, just take i take my time and enjoy life a lot more now than i ever did as, as a younger person i would say well, this leads perfect for the next question I have for you. <laughs> um, what are some advice you can give, I guess, to someone who is struggling, someone who is trying to fit into a mold, knowing that the mold is not for them, but also trying to carve their own path, but terrified? I think you, you can't change the world in a day and you can't change yourself. You don't, a person doesn't change overnight and you have to, um, you pick your battles. Not every battle you should be faced on every day. Uh, you know, the world is a precarious place right now, and there are all sorts of reasons why you might choose not to change. You might be afraid that you can't afford something. Or, you know, economics drive a, a huge number of decisions. Um, so financial literacy is actually really important, I would say, and become financially literate about money and how it's made and how it's spent and how you keep it and how you don't waste it. Uh, you know, stupid things. And, and I know I'm getting a little off topic, but, uh, coffee, I stopped more or less buying coffee years and years ago. I don't know if you remember that I used to bring a thermos. Yeah, yeah. Of With coffee. a little bit of Bailey's in it sometime, or your wife is the oh, one. My wife, Bailey's. my wife likes Bailey's. <laughs> but if you add up the number, like I drink a lot of coffee, so I added up how much I was spending on coffee, and if you spending fifteen bucks a day on coffee or twenty bucks, it fucking adds up. 
right? And you think about all that coffee and how much it costs when you buy it. And so I bought a $75 thermos. I got a nice thermos. Yeah. Coffee was hot. Saved hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And, you know, so my needs are, are but sorry, financial literacy is important. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, you know, pick your battles. Everything can't happen and don't be afraid to fail. And, and if you fail, get right back up and try, try again. And nothing happens really that's successful on the, on the first try. And don't be afraid to fail. Like, and, and depending on what you're after, don't be afraid to hear no if someone doesn't like your idea. Don't be afraid when someone says your idea is not for me or uh, don't be afraid if they don't understand what you're trying to do because not everybody does and you have to be okay with that and you have to do it for yourself I would say because no one's going to do it for you no. your mother's not going to your parents aren't <laughs> going to do for you your sibling can't do it your best friend can't do it for you they can help you they can give you emotional support but they can't physically do it yeah. and and uh you kind of got to rely on yourself a little bit to get trust, yourself trust yourself I yeah think. <laughs> trust yourself and just like you got this talk to your i talk to myself all the time <laughs> It's, it's important. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I might not say it out loud, but sometimes I do. You got this. You got this. I don't know. And yeah, fear is good. It keeps you on your toes. It keeps you alive. It, it keeps you, gets you up in the morning. And, you know, being afraid to, that you can't eat or being afraid that you can't live the way you want to live is motivation for a lot of people. Not everybody. Mm -hmm. And then after you can live and feed yourself, then you have different choices, right? You have to deal with the base requirements. Yeah, your basic then, needs first. <laughs> right. <laughs> survival. Survival. You got to survive. So, you know, if you want to leave your job, maybe you can't leave your job because it's not the time. But maybe it is. And I don't know. Yeah. But I just... <sighs> Very wise words, David. Thank you. <laughs> I just uh, keep trucking one day at a time and not every day is going to be perfect either. Yes. And that's okay. It's yeah. part of the process. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but it is to me, it's the journey. I really, I've always enjoyed the journey and my journey has not been straight. And uh, yeah, you don't always know what's around the, the corner. So you kind of have to be open to it. And be open to change and be open to learning and new skills and, and new people. Some people aren't even open to, like, new friends. They've got enough. I don't know. Whatever it is. I just find you have to be open to it. And you find unexpectedness in unexpected places. And, and people, are, beautiful people, are general, <laughs> people are generally good. Yeah. Really. Yes. Well, like you. Oh, thank you. I've got some rapid fire questions to wrap oh, this up. Okay. <laughs> What's the best compliment you've ever received? Oh, I love you. A book that's changed your life. <laughs> or movie or no, anything no, 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 that comes no. in mind. <laughs> uh, I've, 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 I, lots of, um, I don't know if I have a book that changed my, my life. I've read a lot and I take a little bit from every book. I'm not kind of driven like that. Like there's nothing that one day someone will tell me that will change my life overnight. <laughs> not going to happen. But there are a lot of people who read this one book about quitting smoking and quit so, oh. but that's not me <laughs> uh, i have a really really fantastic gardening book and and i like that book and and the joy of cooking how about that the joy of cooking the joy of cooking yeah you know, everything you ever need to know for cooking as a base is in the joy of cooking 
changed my life. I'll add it. I'll add it. What does coming home mean to you? Coming home to yourself. Coming home to yourself. Uh, maybe being comfortable in your own skin. What would you like more of? Everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's totally fine. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> Everything. Um, advice for your younger self? Uh, follow your dreams and um, do it for yourself. And finally, where can people find you? I'm everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a website, bastido.com, and I think on Instagram, I'm David underscore Bastido. And anything David Bastido will find me somewhere we'll or Bastido. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Bastido.com is my website mm -hmm. and David underscore Bastido is my Instagram. I'll link it. I'll link it in the video as well Thank so you. people can find you. Any projects, offerings, things you want to, you're working on right now? No, life. Life? Yeah. Life. No. Um, I sell photographs. People want to look at my photographs, but uh, other than that, no, I'm just cruising. I'm happy. Just cruising. Yeah. Thank you so I don't much. Need to offer, I don't need to <laughs> offer anything else. <laughs> if they want it, they are open to. <laughs> I'm open to, you know, so many things, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to hear from people, and, and I've enjoyed our conversation, Jess, and this is quite lovely. It's been very nice to hang out with you and see you again. Thank you for sharing your story and your wisdom. Oh. <laughs> there were so many moments, I'm like, yes, that's so true. See, but it, these, are the, these are the parts where I'm like, oh my God, I'm rolling my eyes, like someone calling me wise, because I'm just like... It's inspiring, I, just, I think. I, it's I just, that energy. No, I, I, I get it. I just find I have trouble internalizing it. I get it. It's okay, too. <laughs> Thank you for being you, David. You're most welcome. It was a real <laughs> pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review on iTunes. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.